Good morning, and welcome to Medicine Grand Rounds. This is a uh, uh, special Grand Rounds, and the, the, uh, the first opportunity for one of our chief residents this year to uh, present for us. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Sharon Azar. Sharon graduated from the University of Portland for her undergraduate degree and then took her MD at, uh, at OHSU in Portland. And we were delighted to recruit her to our residency. And this year she serves as the uh, primary care track chief resident, the Trowbridge family endowed chief resident. She's been a leader throughout her life and career. And I make note she was on the student council for her class in medical school. She did some, uh, some basic science uh, back uh, in starting in an undergrad, looking at baroreflex in rats um, who were pregnant, which is an interesting <laughs> direction. Not sure exactly how that fit with her career plan, but, but uh, all science is good and, and basic science experience is actually wonderful. She served as a medic volunteer. She's a member of the American Academy of Hospice and Palliative Medicine, the American College of Physicians, and the Gold Humanism. Society. She's received a number of awards over the years, including the Sobe Matthew Award as an intern, the John Peterson Education Award for Hospice and Palliative Medicine Scholars, the Doc Award from the Department of Medicine, and uh, most recently the Sunday Award from the Department of Medicine awarded by medicine house staff to a resident who demonstrates the importance of putting one's personal ego aside, working as a team, and treating a patient not just as someone who is an interesting case but also a full-fledged human being, just summarizing the, the great professionalism that Dr. Azar shows in everything she does. Today she is going to be speaking not about pregnant rats, but uh, a, a very timely, important topic uh, entitled uh, Sentence to Fail, Releasing Incarcerated Prisoners into a Turbulent Healthcare System. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Azar as she gives her first grand round. everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Um, so I really wanted to give a talk that revolved around one of the many vulnerable populations that I got exposure to uh, during my residency at the University of Wisconsin. Um, I came here with a really big interest in practicing medicine with an underserved population. And what I think our residency does so well um, is give its residents such tremendous exposure to the wide variety of patients and the population that exists within the state's walls. And one of the populations that I continued to see throughout my residency included men and women both pre and post incarceration in my continuity clinic, as well as those that were actively incarcerated. And whether that was in the inpatient setting while I was rotating on subspecialty clinics, or whether that was even on my own primary care track block working in Dr. Jim Sossman's HIV prison medicine clinic, or Dr. Laura uh, Morsetter's uh, nephrology prison telemedicine clinic. And as the years went by, I slowly learned what an immensely vulnerable population this was. And I learned that incarceration in and of itself was such an impactful social determinant of health. And it was through these experiences that I developed this increasing awareness about the risks and the higher needs of this population as they transitioned out of prison and back into the community. So like any well-trained internal medicine resident, I started to ask a lot of questions. And I started asking questions to my patients, my attendings, and even the community leaders in the DOC. And what I came to learn and the stories that I heard were startling. Um, the mortality rate of someone being released from prison in just their first two weeks is 12 times higher than that of the general population. 12 times higher, which I thought was just shocking. Um, and so I realized that there was an obvious gap here. There is a system breakdown that's happening somewhere along the line. And I slowly came to understand that this transition out of prison was a setup for failure. And I came to learn that we as physicians have a really important role to play in it. So what I'm hoping to do is start off with a story, a man from my continuity clinic. So this is Nathaniel. He was one of my continuity clinic patients during my intern year. He was not the healthiest of men. He was obese, hypertension, diabetes, depression, anxiety. He had these diffuse joint pains, ultimately was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. And at the time he was living in Madison, though he was originally from Milwaukee, and that's where his family, consisting of his girlfriend and his two children lived. And he'd come out to Madison for a job opportunity that he thought would kind of pull his family out of poverty. 
And ultimately, it did not work for Nathaniel with his job, but he stayed in Madison for the year, kind of trying to find other opportunities. Nathaniel also had a history of substance abuse. He told me at times that he kind of relapsed and intermittently went back into drinking alcohol when times were rough. He had also told me that historically, he had had times where he had actually sold drugs to be able to kind of make a living wage for his family. He had been incarcerated for this in the past, long before I met him, maybe 10 years prior. But he was an incredibly positive man, despite his hardships. And Nathaniel would come into my clinic, and he'd recount stories from his life, and he was a sensitive man, and he would, he would shed a few tears, we'd share a few laughs. Um, and over that year, I saw Nathaniel struggle. I saw him struggle with employment, I saw him struggle with housing, I saw him struggle with sobriety. And in the midst of all of that, I struggled to control any of his chronic conditions. And it was just too hard because there was just simply too much chaos in Nathaniel's life. And then one day in clinic, I go, I check my paper in basket, and I, get a, I have a fax from the Milwaukee ER. It's about Nathaniel. Presumably, he must have been visiting his family. He got intoxicated, he got behind the wheel of a car, and he drove into a brick wall. And Nathaniel was OK physically, but at that moment, I knew that Nathaniel had thrust himself back into the hands of the legal system. And as a newly minted physician that was at the time very ignorant of the impact of incarceration, I stood on the sidelines and sort of watched Nathaniel's life unfold and unravel over the coming years. And I'll continue to tell you Nathaniel's story throughout this talk. But what I really hope all of you walk away from this talk um, understanding is just having an increased awareness of this re-entry process. And in order to do that, you've got to understand a couple of things first. First, we have to really understand what the prison system looks like, what's happening with incarceration rates across America, and how is that impacting the health of these individuals. Then you've got to understand prison health itself, prison medicine. What does care for these individuals look like in the prison system? And what are the diseases and disorders that are uniquely prevalent in this population? And then, and only then, can we really actually touch on the topic of reentry. And at that point in time, I want to tell you about all the different factors that are involved in reentry who is handling reentry well around the country, and what we can learn from that and how we can participate in that as physicians moving forward. All right, so let's start off with the history of incarceration. I just think this is fascinating. So our prison system is actually based off the model of the English workhouse, which was developed in the 1500s in England. And um, at that time, England presumably had a problem with vagrancy or homelessness that was really perceived to be uh, the product of idleness or laziness. And so as a cure to this laziness, they developed these workhouses, these places where they would take people off of the streets, put them into these houses, and, and make them do a lot of heavy labor in order to kind of get them working again and then release them so they could be productive members of society. And um, it wasn't until the 1700s that they began to actually use that as a form of criminal punishment. They believed that criminals were not productive members of society, they weren't contributing, so we might as well take them off the streets and put them to work so they actually do um, productive work for us. And then the United States slowly adopted the same model, um, especially after the revolution, and over the centuries to come, we just sort of saw shifts in what that looked like, kind of ranging from a more punitive time period, and that's when we introduced segregation units, then also kind of swinging to a more rehabilitative time period where we focus more on therapy and sanitation in the prison system. And now we're somewhere kind of as a mix between the two. So before we get too deep into this talk, there's a couple key definitions that I just wanted to go over, primarily going over the difference between jails and prisons. And the difference between these two systems is who oversees these systems and then also how long someone is actually incarcerated for. So in jails, you're gonna see people with short-term incarceration, people that are sentenced to less than a year. It's also where people oftentimes wait until they're sentencing. And these are overseen by the local jurisdiction. So they're overseen by the counties. So a way a jail works and operates has a lot of variability. It varies from county to county. Prisons, on the other hand, are overseen by the state and federal correctional authorities. So there's a lot more standardization of how they look. Um, but they're longer term facilities. So if you've been sentenced for more than a year, you're gonna go to prison. Parole and probation are two kind of community 
um, sentences. That's where you kind of carry out your sentence in the community. And then the other key definitions to go over is the difference between incarceration, which refers to people in, in jails and prisons, and imprisonment, which really refers to people only in state or federal prisons. So let's talk a little bit about what's happening with incarceration in the United States. So our correctional population actually peaked at around 7.3 million in 2007. And since that time, we've noticed a pretty steady decline in our correctional population. As of 2014, it was 6.8 million. Now I wanna be clear here, this refers to our entire correctional population. So it refers to people serving their time in the community, those on parole and probation, as well as those that are actually incarcerated in jail or in prison. And the distinction here is really important because when you actually look at what, which population has actually been declining over the years, it's the population on probation. Meanwhile, when you actually look at the um, people that are in jail, that number has actually been going up over this time period. And when you actually look at the number of people in prison, that number has actually been pretty stagnant over the last seven years. So there are seven jurisdictions that make up half of the US correctional population. And again, I just find this to be really interesting. Um, of note, uh, Wisconsin is much lower than all of these, 89,000 individuals. And I think this graphic is really helpful. While it's small, the arrow is Wisconsin. And you can kind of see where Wisconsin ranks on, amidst all the states. It's sort of right in the center. But perhaps a more disappointing statistic for Wisconsin is that Wisconsin uniquely has the highest incarceration rate of black men in the entire country, 12.8%, which is almost twice as much as the United States average of 6.7%. I think it really helps to kind of put these numbers in context by looking at global incarceration rates. Um, and the global prison population is a little bit more than 10 million. And what you really need to understand is that when you look at most countries around the world, there really isn't the same distinction that's made between jails and prisons. They tend to be one thing. But when we look at the prison population, it's actually rising globally faster than the actual population growth, which is really startling. The U.S. has the highest incarceration rate of any country in the world. It carries more than one-fifth of the world's prisoners, which is about 2.2 million people in custody on any given day. So the next logical question is why? What's going on in America that has led to all of these really high incarceration rates? And I can tell you from doing a lot of reading on this subject, I think it really boils down to three major things. The first is the deinstitutionalization of mental health care. So this happened between the 1970s and the 1980s. Um, it was the product of both President Carter and President Reagan's um, uh, terms. And President Carter um, really didn't, really wanted to take better care of our mentally ill. Didn't think that these big institutions were doing a good job of that. And really wanted to shuttle them out of these big institutions into kind of these local community facilities where they could get kind of better, more personalized care. Um, and Reagan came on board and he also was in agreement with that and was also in agreement with kind of breaking down these institutions that were really costly um, and subsequently took away all of these institutions but in return there wasn't enough funding to build adequate resources for these individuals. And so what this did was unfortunately leave, release a lot of people who are mentally ill, did not provide them adequate treatment and essentially put them in the hands of the legal system. The other big aspect is the war on drugs. Again, this started in the 1970s, but really continued over the following um, couple of decades. This really started kind of on a statewide level because drug crimes and the drug use was a, a really big problem, in the, especially in the early 70s. Um, and Governor Rockefeller in New York um, had started some of the nation's toughest drug laws with really steep minimum sentences for drug crimes. Um, and over the years, other states began to adopt the same model. And he got a lot of community buy-in as well because a lot of community leaders believed that um, addicts were sort of toxic to their communities, particularly the, the underserved communities. Um, and so at that time, it was really believed that the best thing to do was to incarcerate them and to raise these steep rates. And over the following decade, we began to actually see declining rates of drug use and drug, drug, drug crimes. Um, and then President Reagan, during his presidency, kind of reintroduced this subject um, to the population with the Just Say No to Drugs campaign. And during his presidency, again, we saw another big shift in the rise of um, incarcerating um, people that were using drugs. And so by the late 1990s, about a fifth of all state prison inmates were drug crime offenders. 
And I think the last biggest push, and perhaps the latest one, happened between the 90s to the early 2000s, was uh, mandatory sentencing. So California had actually started this. They started a three strikes rule, where if you committed any three felonies, your minimum sentence was then automatically gonna be 25 years. And if one of those felonies was a serious or a violent crime, your sentence was gonna be life in prison. And mind you, the definition of a serious crime is pretty ambiguous, and it can mean even stealing a bicycle from someone's garage. So that would get you life in prison if you had two other felonies. Um, and so over the decades, we began to see our prisons start to get really overcrowded. And so as a response to overcrowding, we didn't fully overturn the three strikes rule, but we allowed a little bit more judicial discretion to be involved so that if um, the judge didn't feel like the punishment fit the crime, he actually, he or she had the permission to actually lower the sentence if he felt that that was warranted. So the problem with high incarceration rates, I don't think I have to talk about this too much, but the problem is cost, okay? And, and as you can see, since the 1980s, the cost that we've spent on our DOC has increased exponentially. Um, of that, we spent about $7.5 billion nationally on healthcare for our DOC. Um, I think more importantly for all of us in the room, particularly from a pub public health perspective, is the issue of safety. Um, as I mentioned, this has led to a lot of overcrowding and the question is whether or not amidst all of this overcrowding, um, whether or not we're able to really provide adequate resources to this very needy population. So a lot of you are probably aware that incarceration has been in the news pretty heavily. Um, and, and really it's been in a matter of kind of the overcrowding and noticing our, our rising incarceration rates. And so while it's easier to see a lot of these individuals as sort of separate from the community because we lift them off the streets and we whisk them away and put them behind bars, um, I think we have to remember that 95% of people that ultimately get incarcerated get released back to the streets again. And with overcrowding now being more of an issue, I think we can even expect that number to continue to rise as evidenced by um, the Justice Department's release of 6,000 prisoners last year, and President Obama also released about 90 inmates as well, granted them clemency. So the question is, are prisons doing what we need them to do? If we're seeing 95% of these people come back to our society, are prisons effective? There are a number of Supreme Court, court cases that looked into um, trying to link overcrowding to poor health outcomes. And all of them failed except for this one. So I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about this one because I think it's a very important case. So Brown versus Plata in 2011. And the California prison system was actually being monitored for 30 years because back in 1979, they were already at 96% capacity and people started to worry at that time. By 2011, when this trial was conducted, the capacity in California prisons was for 85,000 people, inmates. And they were twice that much. They were at 156,000 inmates. So the question that was being raised by this trial is, are these overcrowded facilities safe? And what the court ultimately ended up looking at was photographic evidence that showed the overcrowded facilities. And they also reviewed multiple different cases that were kind of bring, being brought to their attention. These cases included a gentleman who died of abdominal pain after a five week delay into being referred to a subspecialist, a gentleman that died of chest pain after an eight hour delay in evaluation, a man that died of testicular cancer after complaining of testicular pain for um, 17 months, and a gentleman with mental health issues that was detained in one of those phone booth sized cages that you can see in the upper right hand corner without a toilet and a pool of his own urine for 24 hours while awaiting transfer. And the court also looked at the vacancy rates and felt like the job vacancy rates and felt like um, all these prisons were understaffed in terms of mental health providers and physicians. And they felt like people were being deterred from these jobs because of these heavy caseloads and because of concerns for violence in these overcrowded facilities. And so ultimately the Supreme Court ruled that these conditions were unconstitutional and they actually required that California decrease their inmate population in their prisons by 46,000 people. So what's happening with overcrowding in Wisconsin? And I spent a good time talking to Jim Greer, who's the health services director of the Wisconsin DOC. And he said that the capacity of all of our adult facilities here is about 16,000, but we are currently, quote unquote, way over capacity. 
Our current total population of incarcerated individuals is 23,000. He said double bunking or having multiple inmates in a single cell is common. They have insufficient treatment programs. Not everybody's able to get through AOD before their release that needs to be. And mental health facilities are always at capacity. So we've always got to move a couple people out to get a couple people in. All right. So at this point in time, I want all of you to have a good understanding of our prison system and how it came to be what it is today. I want you to know that we have too many people in prison due to a broken sentencing system and an inability to provide adequate care for our mentally ill and addicted populations. This has more recently become problematic after realizing that overcrowding has a very negative impact on health outcomes for this population. And what I want all of you to think about as we move on to the next kind of topic and talk about healthcare delivery in prison is how effectively can these overcrowded facilities provide care to a very medically complex population. Okay, so let's revisit Nathaniel briefly. So as you'll remember, he had just been intoxicated, driven drunk, drove into a brick wall. He was ultimately sentenced to three years in prison. What I came to later learn about him was his first year of prison was actually pretty tough. Um, he became estranged from his family. They stopped coming to visit him. They were just too angry about his relapse into substance abuse. Um, and I want you to also remember that Nathaniel wasn't a, a well guy. He had a lot of medical conditions all of which were not very well treated by myself before he um, became in incarcerated. And during that first year, Nathaniel actually got much better control of a lot of these chronic conditions. His blood pressure was below goal. Diabetes wasn't below goal, but pretty darn close. And for the first time in his life, his rheumatoid arthritis was under good control. He actually came to the UW Rheumatology Prison Clinic. He got started on triple therapy, and his joint pain was better than it had been his entire life. So think about Nathaniel as we kind of start talking about what healthcare in the prison system looks like. So I want to clarify that I'm going to be really talking about what healthcare looks like in prison because again, in jails, there's a lot of variability here. Typically, the healthcare team consists of a, a physician, an NP, or maybe a PA, maybe a mental health provider, and then a lot of nursing staff. And in order to be seen, an inmate needs to submit a sick call slip. And this gets reviewed by a nurse every day um, and once they get triage to having an appointment, a prisoner actually needs to pay a copay to be seen. And the copays are small relatively, two to five dollars, which I know does not sound like a lot, but you remember that in the context of prison, prisoners don't make a lot of money. They make like 20 cents an hour, in some cases less. Um, and there have been many organizations that have stepped up saying that these copays, although albeit small, can actually sometimes be prohibitive to actually getting care and seeking out care when you need it. That being said, um, in the setting of emergencies, in the setting of a communicable illness, those copays are always waived. All right. So there are multiple different sizes of facilities in Wisconsin, um, and uh, I don't want to kind of get into all of the details of that, but just know that these are kind of rough averages for us here. So there's typically one physician per 1,000 inmates. And for that same population, there's typically about seven to 10 RNs that kind of work seven days a week around the clock. Both physicians and RNs end up seeing patients. They both have scheduled appointments. And in Wisconsin, we use a very similar system to what I just kind of described on the previous slide. We use a blue slip system. So anytime an inmate wants to get medical care, dental care, or psychiatric care, they submit one of these blue slips. And that's reviewed every 24 hours by a triage RN. But just because it's being reviewed by 24 hours does not mean that you get to be seen anytime soon. And in my conversation with Jim Greer, he said that there's quite a few delays in care that can be up to weeks at a time. Um, a lot of the subspecialty care is actually contracted out. And while there are multiple subspecialty clinics that see our prison inmate population over at the UW, um, UW has exclusive care of all of the hep C and HIV patients in the state. All right, so statewide totals, roughly 25 PCPs working for the DOC across the straight state, approximately 30 psychiatrists. A lot of these work part-time. And, and for a lot of patients that are kind of in more of these rural facilities, they actually participate in like psychiatric telemedicine and they have about 4,000 telemedicine appointments every year. And this has really increased the access to psychiatric care across the state. 
60 nurse practitioners, they're planning on hiring actually quite a few more of those. And while um, the job vac vacancy rates for mental health providers, um, for nurses, and for physicians are improving, they still remain pretty high across the state. Um, the latter two points are really points that Jim Greer brought up for me. I was asking him kind of what he felt like the biggest barriers were for hiring. And he told me he really felt like the, the salaries weren't kind of rising on par with what they were doing for other physicians around the state and also kind of decreased pension compensation. Okay, let's shift gears just a little bit to actually talking about what the actual state of the health looks like for a, an average inmate. What I really want you to get away from this part is that these inmates are really sick, okay? They have a very high burden of disease compared to the general population. Major medical issues include mental health issues, substance abuse, communicable diseases, and then chronic conditions. So let me tell you briefly about each of these. So mental health issues are really prevalent. More than 50% of inmates have some type of mental health problem. 10 to 25% actually have a serious mental illness with major affective disorder or with schizophrenia. Unfortunately, bigger studies that are looking at um, people that are treated for mentally ill and their links to incarceration are lacking. There's a lot of small studies that suggest that there's a, uh, that there's a correlation between the two. But the major point here, I think, and as I've read through so many articles on this subject, the points that everyone that's doing research on this subject kind of emphasizes is that perhaps we are criminalizing something that shouldn't be criminalized, and perhaps we should be turning our attention more to actually treating, the, treating mental illness to kind of help break this cycle because when we're not treating mental illness, people are self-medicating with substances or with alcohol. Um, and then people are also kind of acting out or doing behaviors that are calling the attention of our law enforcement. And police will often divert these individuals to our criminal justice system as opposed to our mental health system just due to limited resources. In the same vein is substance abuse. So the prevalence of substance abuse across the nation is 9%. When you look at that within the prison or jail population, it's somewhere upwards of 45 to 50%. Um, one third of state inmates committed their current offenses under the influence of drugs. 16 to 18% committed their offenses to get money for drugs. So this is a really big issue. And like with mental illness, I have to ask the same question. Are we criminalizing addiction when we should be medicalizing addiction? And instead of kind of focusing on creating more resources to actually prevent and break this cycle. All right, so communicable diseases are pretty prevalent when we talk about our prison population. I know a lot of us tend to think about TB when we think about our incarcerated population, and um, incarceration is definitely still a risk factor for TB, but our TB rates as a nation have actually dropped pretty substantially. So we have the lowest national rates we've ever had as of 2010. Back in 1997, it was estimated that about 40% of the diet the um, people diagnosed with TB had actually passed through the incarceration system. And as of 2010, that number was only 4.3%. So it's getting better. I wish I could say the same for sexually transmitted diseases. Those are still highly prevalent amidst our prison population. The CDC says that um, incarceration is one of the biggest risk factors for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And then we also need to think about syphilis as well, which is very interestingly more predominant in female inmates than it is in male inmates touch on HIV briefly as well. And overall, HIV is still highly prevalent um, in our incarcerated population, though the prevalence of that has been improving slightly over the last decade. Um, we have pretty variable numbers depending on what source you go to, because it really depends on the modality of screening that's happening at the prison, whether or not you have opt-out screening that'll definitely detect a lot more, or screening on request. But I will say that the CDC has actually recommended um, HIV testing for all inmates. And since that recommendation has been made, um, we have noticed kind of rising um, HIV screening upon um, prison entry. Hepatitis C, a little bit different, because hepatitis C is kind of relatively new, and there aren't really any guidelines to direct people about screening this inmate population. That being said, screening for HCV is happening at a, a much faster, much um, increasing rate across the nation, especially in Wisconsin. Prisoners are at a much higher risk of HCV than the general population, anywhere from eight to 20 times higher. And like I said, Wisconsin's doing great work with this. They now screen all of their men on entry to Dodge Correctional and all of their women upon entry to, um, to Cheetah. All right, chronic conditions. 
So when you look at this list, for any general internist in the room, this is going to look like kind of the same things that your patients come to your clinic with as well. But all of these things occur at much higher rates in the incarcerated population than they do for age match controls of the general population. So keep that in mind as we move forward. And the other thing that's important is that people have long sentences. So people are aging slowly in the prison population. And with that, we've noticed that aging is costly. Dr. Jim Sossman has actually um, started doing some research on the aging prison population. But when I talked um, to Jim Greer, he said that we had over 4,400 inmates that were over the age of 50 and over 600 inmates that were over the age of 65. And the reason aging is so costly is because with aging, you'll have some really expensive diseases, CKD, so having to pay for people on dialysis or HCV. And the cost of those hepatitis C drugs are so expensive, they've actually cost, caused the, um, a tremendous increase in um, the DOC's expenditure on medications for its population over the last few years alone. All right, so let's talk about standards of care for prison health care. And there's a lot of different associations that have sort of put out recommendations and standards of care. One of the most popular is the National Commission on Correctional Health Care. And they put out the, these great standards of care um, and actually offer accreditation for this. Um, and there's about 500 facilities that are actually accredited by the NCCHC um, for providing good standards of care. But what I'll say the problem is, is that there are no systematic studies to actually provide any evidence that these facilities that are accredited are actually meeting these standards of care. And the other problem is that there's no kind of universal system to enforce any type of quality control in the prison setting. I think that's a little bit problematic. And the other, the other issue that we face is that when it comes to medical documentation, that's pretty variable from facility to facility. Most are still using paper charting. Um, and there are a lot of anecdotal stories of, of charts being really delayed in their delivery to, to um, patients' appointments. Wisconsin, however, is going to be adopting um, an EMR in the next couple of years, which is great. Okay, so before I move into my last section, I wanna make sure that all of you um, understand that prisons play a really critical role um, in public health and diagnosing and treating a lot of conditions. Prisons, although not designed for healthcare, do a really good job of providing care, especially as most of these individuals had really poor access to care prior to entry. That being said, this is an incredibly sick population, much sicker than the general population, and resources in prison are limited, particularly when it comes to resources for addiction and mental illness. <clears throat> and perhaps the needs of this population are out of proportion to the level of care that can be provided. So I want you to keep this in mind as we sort of move forward and talk about preparing an inmate for release, remembering that 95% of people that come in ultimately come back out to the community. So let's revisit um, Nathaniel's story for the last time. So I actually had the good fortune of running into Nathaniel again in my PGY3 year when I was on rheumatology consults, rotating in the rheumatology prison clinic. And at that time, um, to my surprise, Nathaniel was in this clinic and he um, told me that he was actually gonna be released early on parole. As you'll remember, he was estranged from his family, so he had a plan to kind of return to a halfway house um, and then ultimately kind of go and, and stay with a friend that he knew um, back in Milwaukee. Again, he was really hopeful. He was really excited about his release, um, and he had really high hopes that he would find a job and regain the trust of his family, and he shared that with me that day. So that day in rheumatology clinic, um, we had sort of bid Nathaniel adieu. We sent him out with a 30-day supply of his triple therapy, encouraged him to establish with a rheumatologist as soon as possible, but ideally a PCP within his first few weeks, so he didn't have any lapses in his care. And Nathaniel went back to the prison system. And in preparing for reentry, he went and met with a social worker, which is what all, all of our inmates do, to get signed up for Medicaid. Nathaniel um, had actually lost his insurance upon entry to the prison system. That's what happens to most individuals. You can either have your insurance suspended or terminated depending on what state you live in. Wisconsin terminates your insurance. So you've got to sign up anew upon release. But unfortunately, Nathaniel did not leave enough time for this appointment. He kind of pushed it a little bit too late. He did not get signed up for Medicaid prior to, re to release. So he was released uninsured. So he was already behind the eight ball upon his release. 
He lived in the halfway house for 30 days. He then went and stayed with a friend. It did not work out with his friend. He got kicked out. He really had no place to go. He went and stayed with an acquaintance back from his kind of drug using days. He tried to find a job. He faced a lot of the same barriers that he had beforehand with his history of incarceration. Um, and amidst this housing instability, this societal instability, this employment instability, Nathaniel definitely did not prioritize his health care. So a couple months out after discharge, he had long run out of all of his medications. Um, he hadn't signed up for Medicaid. He hadn't established with a primary care doctor, let alone a rheumatologist, and he no longer had any of his meds. So naturally, his joint pain started to worsen, severely so, and he started to develop these kind of really bad pounding headaches that we later learned was due to uncontrolled hypertension. And Nathaniel ended up in the ER. He didn't have a copy of his medical records. He wasn't given one on release. And Nathaniel wasn't the best at articulating his medical problems. So the ED unknowingly gave him some opiates. They also started him on an antihypertensive, and they told him to follow up with his PCP. Mind you, again, Nathaniel doesn't have a PCP. And so amidst this tremendous defeat, despite his best efforts, Nathaniel ended up using again. He violated his parole, and he landed back in prison. Nathaniel's story exemplifies the failure of this very important transition of care. Here we have this very highly motivated man, and he was released to navigate this complex social health care and justice system without any support. So let's dive into talking a little bit more about this reentry process. I want to just take note uh, of this painting in the background. It's going to be part of an exhibit that's coming to the Madison Public Library on March 3rd called Artists in Absentia. Amy Zelensky pointed this out to me. Um, and it features artwork from inmates at the Oak Hill Correctional Institute in Oregon, Wisconsin. And this is one of those paintings that I think is really powerful. Okay, so I've been using the term reentry so many times throughout this talk, and it refers very simply to a former inmate's return to their community from prison. And reentry includes a lot of high stakes tasks. Okay, you've got to obtain housing, you need to reintegrate into your families and communities. Like Nathaniel, most often people don't have access to their families anymore, they're estranged, they burned those bridges. So that part's particularly hard for people. You've got to navigate access to supportive services, and you need to find employment. And like I said, a history of incarceration is a tremendous barrier to employment. And when you actually look at the wages of those that are formerly incarcerated, even when you kind of match people up based on experience, they make far less than, than age match and experience match controls. You've got to gain access to health care, and you've got to do all of this while abiding by the restrictions of parole and other legal sanctions. So oftentimes, amidst all of this, healthcare is a very low priority, and, and multiple studies have shown a high use of emergency services during this time. There was actually a Medicaid, Medicare study um, that looked at 110,000 people that were released from a correctional facility between 2002 and 2010, and they found that the rates of hospitalizations were incredibly high amidst this population compared to the general population, and they found that within 90 days of release, one in 12 former inmates was hospitalized. All right, another story. This is Katina Smith, and perhaps some of you recognize her. She's been in the news a lot lately because she's got a relatively famous son, Demarius Thomas, who plays for the Denver Broncos. So Katina spent 15 years of a mandatory 20-year sentence um, for drug crimes before she was granted clemency by Barack Obama in 2015. She was one of those 90 individuals that I mentioned earlier in my talk. And on the day of release, Katina, like anyone on their day of release, just kind of steps out of the prison walls for the first time in over a decade, hops into a cab that's going to take her to a bus station that's going to get her home. But when she closed the door, she heard for the first time in her life the sound of automatic locks. And she panicked. She questioned why was this cab driver trying to lock her in the car. She started screaming and yelling and pushing on the door, all while amidst this chaos, the cab driver is just trying to explain to Katina the concept of automatic locks. And this new world and the exposure and the shock of it didn't stop there. She had to learn what debit cards were, the Blockbuster videos no longer existed, that Walkman no longer existed. And she talked about so many times when she felt like her head was just going to explode. Her head would hurt from the information overload. And I felt like one article put this so well. So I'm going to read an excerpt of that. It reads, it's been six months since she was released from federal prison, 15 years into a 20-year drug sentence. 
It's been 10 weeks since she left a halfway house and moved back home. Eight weeks since she bought her first cell phone. Five weeks since she learned to drive again. Four weeks since she met some of her nieces and nephews for the first time. And it has only been two days since her most recent panic attack, which she spent holed up in her bedroom, overwhelmed by the freedoms and the stresses of the outside world. I have to say, I really appreciate this story. I really appreciate this article because it really focuses on, on the problem of just one of those things that I showed you that someone has to go through uh, with reentry. It just fo focuses on social reintegration and how tumultuous that is in and of itself. And I read so many stories like Katina's over the years, men that struggled to just simply go to an IHOP with, for breakfast with their family. And they all highlight how hard it is to avoid triggers for panic disorder, depression, and PTSD, all while trying to build your adult life anew. It sounds incredibly overwhelming, and without support, it actually sounds nearly impossible. So let's talk a little bit about what preparing for reentry looks like. Now, pre-release planning actually only really takes place, most assuredly, for a few populations people who are HIV positive, and people who are severely mentally ill. If you have a, a, a slew of other chronic uh, conditions, you're not really guaranteed any sort of real pre-release planning. So like Nathaniel, it's a job of the inmate to meet with the social worker one month before the release. No standards across the nation for what this meeting should look like or what needs to be accomplished, but the major goal is to get these individuals signed up for insurance so they have insurance upon release. Oftentimes, people don't really leave enough time for this, and it's very common for people to leave uninsured. And when I was trying to find out kind of how well we were doing in Wisconsin in terms of kind of releasing people on Medicaid, I found out that there were a lot of barriers for our prison system to even collect this information, primarily due to a lot of um, HIPAA laws. And so we don't actually even know how well we're doing. But when you look at how we're doing as a nation globally, 80% of inmates are being released without insurance. During that social worker meeting, there is a possibility they might be able to help with housing. Again, there's no standard for that, but they, don't, they definitely don't help with like creating follow-up appointments for your medical care or making sure that you're established or connected once you leave. So the majority of people will exit without insurance, without health care follow-up, with a limited number of their medications. Most often you get two weeks. If you're lucky, you'll get a, a full month. Um, HIV patients will often get a full month plus a refill just to give them more time. Um, and then they'll get a small amount of money that inmates typically, ultimately, like you get the stipend and you have to typically pay it back to the DOC in order to kind of get a ride to the bus stop or the train station or wherever, wherever it is that you need to go. Um, if you're being released on parole, you typically only have about 24 hours, maybe 48, to get back to your home community before you have your first parole meeting. Um, if you're being released on parole, the DOC typically will help with housing. You'll oftentimes go through a halfway house. Um, you can be there oftentimes, there's variability here, but for 90 days. People oftentimes don't want to go to halfway houses. They're not in good parts of town. They're not places that are in great condition. Um, if you are not on parole and you just completed your sentence and you're being released, you oftentimes are just released. You walk out just like Katina did. And... Um, uh, and the DOC is not really under any sort of obligation to arrange housing for you. All right, so with our last 10 minutes here, let's talk about some research that's happening in the way of reentry. And it only takes 10 minutes because there just simply is insufficient research that's being done on this topic. Um, uh, Ingrid Binswanger is one of the big people in this country that's doing research on reentry. And she published one of the biggest studies and one of the longest studies that have looked at people after release. It was published in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2007, and she looked at 30,000 inmates uh, and released in Washington State over a five-year period of time, and she followed them for two years. Okay, again, this is the longest study that's ever taken place, so she followed them for two years. And she found that in that two-year period of time, the risk of death was 3.5 times higher compared to the general population. And like that statistic that I mentioned at the very beginning, in that first two weeks, it's 12.7 times higher than the general population. And she published a big list of causes that they found of death. The biggest, by and large, was drug overdose. That accounted for over a quarter of all deaths. Cocaine in this study was the biggest culprit. This was followed by cardiovascular disease, um, MIs being a, a big culprit there as well. Um, but again, a lot of those were also associated with drug use. 
homicide, cancer, particularly lung cancer, and suicide also followed. There have been a few other studies that have looked at kind of smaller populations over shorter periods of time. They, in addition to these causes, have identified cirrhosis, hepatocell carcinoma, and HIV as kind of unique high <coughs> causes of mortality amidst this population. So Ingrid's research um, really opened up the door for other research in the ways of reentry. I think everybody was sort of startled by this statistic when she published it. And it really triggered multiple individuals around the country to ask the question, well, how can we do this better? Aaron Fox, so there's a few big, big people that are kind of working on reentry uh, around the country. Aaron Fox is one of those. He's a physician um, out of New York, and he created this Bronx Transitions Clinic as a collaboration where they looked at 135 people with chronic illnesses that they filtered towards this clinic. Um, and what they wanted to look at was what was the impact of this transitions clinic purely on their medical care. So what happened to their health outcomes and what happened to their retention rates? Did they stay in the clinic six months into the study? And what they found was that HIV patients had really high retention rates, 86% at six months. But for people of other chronic illnesses, like opioid dependence, hypertension, diabetes, much lower rates of retention. And they saw a similar pattern when they actually looked at outcomes. So about 54% of the HIV patients had totally suppressed viral loads six months into the study, but when you look at reduced opioid use, blood pressure being below goal, or A1C being below goal, you can see that those numbers just aren't quite as good. And so when Aaron was kind of scratching his head, thinking, well, why are we seeing this difference in our HIV patients? He realized that the HIV patients had unique access to case managers and additional supportive services that these people with other chronic illnesses lacked. So the big conclusion from this study is that early healthcare matters, access matters, but in and of itself, is it really enough? So I want to shift to talking about a slightly different model from one of the other kind of big players in the country, Emily Wong. And she, at the time, was in San Francisco. She partnered with the San Francisco Department of Public Health, and they created a very different model for a transitions clinic. So there are about 2,000 um, former inmates being released to San Francisco annually, and they really wanted to look at people that were in prison because they were kind of the sicker population and the population that came out with the least amount of resources. And so what they did was they kind of picked up people with chronic illnesses at their parole meetings and then filtered them towards this transitions clinic that consisted of two MDs that had experience working with former inmates. And they also had these full-time case managers called community health workers. Very uniquely, these were men and women that were formerly incarcerated that would then partner with these individuals and kind of guide them through the process. So once one of these community health workers would refer, pick up someone with a chronic illness and refer them to the transitions clinic, the inmate, former inmate, would go to the transitions clinic. And on their first appointment, the goal was mainly to address any kind of urgent needs, to screen for any communicable diseases, to provide any medication refills that were needed, to refer to subspecialists as necessary, and then establish primary care. So if you had a pre-existing primary care provider, they're going to do everything they can to link you back with that person. But if you didn't, you could either establish with the transitions clinic staff or with the county clinic staff. But the key to this um, transition clinic and what makes it so unique are these community health workers. And I think the key here is twofold. One is these are individuals that demonstrate successful reentry to the people that they're partnering with, which is huge. And they're able to connect with them on a very different level than anybody else can. And the other part is that these community health workers assist with housing, employment, cultural reintegration, legal aid, substance abuse counseling, the healthcare system navigation, chronic disease self-management, and each of these individuals would carry caseloads of 20 to 30 individuals. And so in a later study, Emily Wong wanted to look at the success of this clinic. And what she found was is that people that went through this transitions clinic had decreased their ED utilization, their ER utilization, by 50% over the 12-month period of time. And they really attribute a lot of that success to the community health workers. And the San Francisco Transitions Clinic has become so successful that it's now a transitions clinic network that exists in seven states around the country. All right, let's quickly talk about what's happening in Wisconsin because great things are happening at the UW too. I have to give credit um, to Dr. Ryan Westergaard and Dr. Jim Sossman um, and their entire ID team that's working on this linkage to care project. They were given funding from the Ryan White Foundation 
to really work on establishing pre-release planning for all of their HIV patients. Um, and, and through that, they were able to hire a social worker that works in their clinic that meets with these individuals prior to their release and then also works with the social worker that's back at the facility and connects these individuals to case managers that are in their community that meet with these individuals on day one, the first day when they go meet with their parole officer. And they really help provide a lot of case management like the community health workers do that I mentioned on the, on the previous page. And preliminarily, um, Dr. Westergaard has found that this program has improved access to care upon release and has also led to improved viral loads at follow-up. So what can we learn from these successful programs? Well, I think we can learn that early health care matters, but that in and of itself, it's insufficient. And when you partner that with case management, you really have a successful system. There are multiple people out there that have published so many reasons why people should care and kind of rally behind this cause. And I think the first two are sort of givens, human rights and, and economics. So I'm not going to spend any time on those, but I do want to spend just a, uh, just a minute, because I think that's all I have, on... Um, prisoner health being public health. Um, release from prison has been associated with a lot of risky behavior. Decreased adherence to your medications, or increased rates of infectivity, and, and like I said, increased rates of risky behavior, unprotected sex, sharing needles, things like that. Um, and so it's just so important to have people involved in this process and caring for this population because the communicable diseases can easily spread and affect a community. But the other thing that's really important that I don't think we oftentimes think about are the families of those that are incarcerated. And there have been so many studies that have looked in children of incarcerated, um, with incarcerated parents and how that has had incredibly negative health, legal, behavioral effects on them in the long run. The other the other topic that I ran across that I just think is so interesting is this public safety idea and whether or not healthcare can actually reduce reincarceration rates, which I think is a really exciting idea. There's only a few studies that show this, um, one of which, and for time I won't really get into it, but what they've really found is that post-release employment and health insurance in a very otherwise high-risk population is associated with lower rearrest rates and drug use, which I find to be so fascinating. I mean, the, these studies really show that um, healthcare has a, a great role to play in this reentry process. So what should we do next? And this is my last slide. Um, the big thing, and I hope you realize this walking away from my talk, is that research in this field is desperately lacking. We don't have enough outcomes research on what happens to these individuals upon release. The longest study is two years. Um, and then we don't really have enough research on what um, is happening within our prison healthcare system and ways to measure that quality of care. So I think we really have to work on that. But I think more importantly, we should really focus on standardizing the discharge process from prison in the same way that we standardize a patient's discharge from the hospital. Okay, think about all of the things you think about before you send someone home from the hospital. Okay, you ask yourself, is this patient safe at home? Do they have someone that's taking care of them or looking out for them? Do they have all the follow-up appointments that they need? So why can't we do that same thing for this very high-risk population? Because we know in the inpatient setting, if you don't check all of those boxes, that patient will surely bounce back to you probably later that week. And as evidenced hopefully by everything that I've told you today, that is apparently also true for our incarcerated population because there's many people like Nathaniel that keep bouncing in and out of this prison system due to failed reentry. And lastly, I think we need more transitions clinics like the ones that I refer to in this talk. Um, just a couple years ago, we had Jody, um, Jody Rich come from Brown who gave a really great talk on opiate overdose and incarceration in America. Um, and he had published this article called Sesame Street Goes to Prison, Physicians Should Follow. And it was in light of Sesame Street introducing a character whose parents were incarcerated. And he made this very eloquent case, this plea for physicians to be more involved with our prison health care system. And I really agree with him more. Um, we as physicians, I think, have such an important role to play in all of this. Um, and perhaps collectively, we can work together to break this cycle. So with that, I want to give my thanks to all of you for coming. And I really want to take a moment just to briefly thank Dr. Addington White and Dr. Jim Sossman. They have been my mentors over the last couple of years um, and provided me tremendous support with this talk, let alone with residency and chief year. And so I'm just immensely grateful for the both of them as well as everybody else that's up here. So thank you all.
That was terrific. Sharon, we've got a few minutes. I'll ask you to call on the audience and repeat the question. Great. Oh my gosh, I totally agree. And while I didn't actually look into any studies Don't of, mind. oh yeah, um, Molly was asking me if I could say something about about the vet the veteran population who should have kind of increasing access to health care and social services. And I think that's so critical. I think when I'm sitting here and describing a lot of these cases, I'm sure a lot of the residents in the room are thinking of vets that they encounter during their residency that look so similar to this picture and do have really high incarceration rates and do have really high rates of substance abuse. And so I fully agree that I think everything that I said here really applies to this population and needing to kind of increase resources for this population as well. And I know that there's actually a good collection of studies that actually look at incarcerated vets as well. I didn't particularly kind of tackle that, but I know that there are people looking into that. Probably not as much as we need, though. Let me just wonder, you just said South, what you were saying, mm -hmm. about easier access to health care and social services through the vet centers. Are there other institutions? Oh, that's a really good idea. And that I actually don't know the answer to, so I can't speak to that. Again, I know the research is out there, but I just don't know. That's a really good question. Yeah, back there, sorry. Um, so, um, here in the prison, the issues are equally the same, but the issues are um, more pervasive um, in one jail and in another, especially in the high rate of incarceration. So, yeah. So what I didn't actually mention in this talk is that, oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting to repeat the question. Um, so what does preventative care look like in the prison system, was what Dr. Fagan asked. So. Um, I didn't mention this, but prevention and screening actually in the in the prison healthcare system is actually pretty darn good in there. Because again, remember, this is a population that otherwise did not have, does not have access to care. Um, and so that is something that I, I read a lot of articles about, and they're actually doing that really well. That's up to standards of what's happening across the nation. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I actually tried to do that and just, I had a few barriers, so I wasn't able to. Oh, and I'm sorry, the question was, I'm so bad at this. Okay, the question was um, if I had really talked to any providers, because a lot of them have their hands tied when they're working in the prison system and really can't provide the level of care that they would like. And I didn't actually speak to any of them that actually work for the DOC. What I did do was speak with um, Dr. Morsetter and Dr. McGowan, who provide kind of the subspecialty care. And I heard very similar stories to the ones you heard. I heard uh, Dr. Morsetter really struggle to get a guy a more comfortable mattress as well. And gosh, that took leaps and bounds as well. So there are a lot of barriers, I agree. We're going to have to close. It's exciting seeing chiefs at this year and future chiefs here in the front cheering you on. And and seeing also the high bar you've set for all of them, Sharon. This is really an outstanding grand round. Thank you so much. Thank you.